Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of product management in Age of AI. My name is Kushbu Goel. I'm the head of product marketing at Crusoe Cloud. But prior to that, I was an ex product lead at Meta for internal products. But more, less about my job. Fun fact while I focus on my uh, day job from eight to six, during the rest of the time, I'm either an aerobatic pilot, you'll find me up in the sky, or you'll find me under the water doing scuba diving. And I just came back from an expedition from California to Alaska where I flew for more than 37 hours. With that said, I wanna, I'm want to i super excited to introduce our panel and I'll start with Prashant. He is a lead WhatsApp business. Uh, he's a lead for a WhatsApp business platform for SMB. He's passionate in helping the small, medium businesses to determine to succeed, you know, by democratizing their enterprise capabilities for small businesses. Fun fact, his mom and his sister both are SMBs in India and have they built their businesses on Instagram and WhatsApp. He has a personal interest in here, guys. With that, I'll go on Omkar, who also comes with a very interesting fun fact. But before that, let's talk about his, his professional experience. He is a PM with experience in working in different industries such as e-commerce, banking, and startups. He he is recently working as a product manager at Shopify, where he leads a marketplace product platform, connecting merchandise with a social e-commerce destination such as Facebook, Google, and TikTok. So anytime you see any advertisement, you need to you know whom to blame. It's Omkar. Um, but fun fact about him, Omkar can polygot that can speak five languages and is actively learning to speak more. Wow. He can be a good travel buddy, guys. Siddharth. Siddharth is a lead product manager at Meta, building avatars. So before joining Meta, he founded StoreZop, a B2B e-commerce platform, worked at Amazon and a few other startups. So great experience Siddharth brings to the table. Fun fact, Siddharth once completed 1,000 kilometers Wow, cycling trek in just one week. And he stayed in camping tents and lived off the gear grid during this thrilling adventure. Imagine no cell phone connection for one week. I don't know how will I survive that. Even in Alaska, I had connection all the time. <laughs> and and la na, last but not the least, Shantanu, who is a director PM at Microsoft with one and a half dozen, one and a half decades of experience in building products and running business functions for cloud and e-commerce space. Fun fact, despite his youthful spirit, he is still an old school, an old soul. Getting lost in magical world of books and the charms of vintage comedy show is his the thing. And I think we should all spend a little bit more time in going back to our traditional way of doing things. With a great introduction, I would like to kick off for what all you guys are here on understanding what does a product management means in the age of AI. So Prashant, I'll actually kick off with you. So let's get started with some housekeeping questions here. AI and product manager world. Can you define AI for a product manager's lens? And maybe quickly walk us through what are the different categories of AI and which are the most relevant to product management today? Of course, thank you. Thanks to meet everyone. Thanks, Kushbu. So AI is a broad term. So the most simplest de definition of AI is tools and technology that makes computer systems smarter and may make our human intelligence. We are product managers. We we'll want to look at AI from the lens of applications. So let's take that lens. So if you think of lens of applications, there are three broad categories uh, which I see for AI. One is machine learning. Machine learning is the most relevant categories for product managers. It's already well established. It's a subset of AI where you use uh, technologies and machines to adapt for data patterns and give you recommendations. Some examples here, you, you're using statistical methods. Some examples are your YouTube recommendations, your Instagram feeds, and your search. Uh, some applications are also in uh, finding patterns such as fraud detection uh, in, um, uh, in a finance organization. 
That's the number one. Number two is deep learning. Deep learning is basically mimicking what your brain does. It's inspired by the functioning of your brain. And it really is uh, a part of uh, part of ML, but it requires more data to train and requires much more compute power. What is a common application for product managers? Number one is uh, generative AI. We all know ChatGPT. That's based on uh, a deep learning model. There are others in gaming. Imagine you're in a game and uh, you have a non-player, uh, a, a non-playing player. We call NPCs and creating those out of a deep learning model. And then there are applications in healthcare where you could actually detect a lot of patterns and make huge advances in the field of uh, uh, genetic studies. That's your second field. Third is robotics process automation. So think about your simple tasks such as filing taxes or uh, finance tasks, which could be automated. And in this field, this field, a uh, typical example is UiPath is a great company. Automation Anywhere is a great company. Here you take a set of paths and then you automate them. So while there, AI is a broad field, uh, but if you look at from product manager lens, these application-based lens helps us to think through different categories and different applications it has in a for a product manager uh, specifically. Thank you, Prashant. That is such an amazing breakdown of AI. Um, maybe Siddharth, you know, like considering there are so many different spaces and it's such a wide space, what skills and knowledge should a product manager possess in this age of AI where there's so many different applications from generative AI to robotics to training and inferences? And how can a product manager up uh, upskill to stay relevant in this field? So again, as Prashant said, it's a it's a wider thing, and AI is so broad that you are you cannot know everything about it. But to begin with, I think you should start with having the awareness awareness of the market and capability which are available. So every second day, a new AI tool is dropping in the market. And while it is not necessary for you to have knowledge of everything, but broadly, you should know in what direction market is going. Like there are many changes in the tech space, like ChatGPT and Bard, and their hugging face and whatnot. That is tech. And then your images. So just know in what direction market is heading so that you can apply some of those things to your own product. Not everything would be relevant. Just try to figure out what is relevant. Another thing is, uh, some of them can actually help you to increase your own efficiency. Like I would say, don't do menial jobs. Like like there are things in your PM where you have to just do stuff. Like if you're not leveraging AI to do that, you are sort of leaving stuff on the table. So just use that. And uh, when it comes to actually working with AI, like in, I, I don't believe that you you have to be expert in AI because. We are the PMs. We are not the engineers for the most part. Some of them are, and it is great if you can code in Python and run your own scripts, but it is not needed per se. What is needed uh, is to have a broader understanding that you can work with your partners, your data scientists, your engineers, or your know, XFN partner, your, so that you can sell the idea of AI if needed. And when it goes to a really detailed one, you can just, you know, uh, you know, Tell the real experts, like really ML engineers and data scientists, to take those deeper questions if needed. And apart from that, it is just regular PMing. So I don't want to say, hey, because it is AI, something is going to change in PMing. Yes, things will change. But your data drivenness is not go going anywhere. You still have to figure out your impact and focus on impact and business acumen. All those things are still very relevant. And then there are new things like privacy concerns. Privacy always have been a big thing in PMing, but lately, because for the most part, AI is a black box. It's very hard to explain why it is doing what it is doing. And I would say, like rather than upskilling, you should try to figure out what is you, like your expectation and where you can lean on your partner. For example, I don't expect any PM to be a legal expert. It's better to just go to your legal partners and seek their help. I think as as far as you have a, this you know ability to figure out things on the go because things are changing every single day. What was relevant yesterday 
may not be relevant after a week these days. I think that's the broader thing is, and it's still very evolving field. So just stay in the touch of what is happening in the market and you'll be fine. I think that is the TLDR. Thank you, Siddhar. That was actually very useful. So just to summarize, being aware of what's happening in the market is number one thing. Always be on top of it, whether it's AI or any other space. And then use basic of your PM roles, skill set. And at the same time, rely on your partners heavily. You're not doing every job. It's not a job of PM to do everything. Rely on your system and partners. It takes a village to get a product out. With that said, maybe, you know, now that we have established what AI means to a PM, Prashant, can you walk us through some of like maybe some of very unique problems? Siddharth already mentioned that privacy is one of the unique problems you always have to think in the AI space. Like maybe a few more, you know, when you're managing AI enabled products and how do you typically approach them? Yeah, sure. First of all, I uh, want to build on what Siddharth said. Uh, most of the problems are really not unique. We see that in our, these are just problems which have changed their structure a bit. They have just the lens, the, the, the way of looking at the problem has changed. But one few unique ones which comes to mind is one so that already touched upon it is solving everything with AI. So like that can become like a fallacy where every problem which comes into mind, you go to solutions first and it becomes very tempting. AI is very powerful. Machine learning algorithms are very powerful. But in most of the cases, at least in my experience, we have seen you start with heuristic. You start with things small, start small without solving everything with AI. So what can a PM do? Always look at the problem. What is the problem we are trying to solve? Who is going, going to benefit? And then will AI, knowing, knowing those capabilities which AI brings to the table and what application of AI you're going to use, are is it actually adding incremental or step function value? Yeah. So without getting caught up into AI yeah, will solve everything. I think that's one is unique because it's very tempting. Second is, uh, again, which amplifies, AI amplifies uncertainty. Just the, it's a probabilistic technology and it's a black box as Siddharth pointed out. So it is even more uncertain. So you have to manage expectations. The roadmaps could be longer. You may not have if, like as quick as uh, impact on metrics as you would do with a non-AI product. In, in, in a lot of cases, you might have to deploy a lot of capital investment. So how do you mitigate that? A is uh, first managing your ex own expectations. We all want quick results. So first looking into yourself and say, hey, look, uh, this, is, this is going to be a longer run. So I need to be much more patient with my own expectations. That's where you start first. B is managing timeframes and expectations with your partners. Explain them, like being making sure communication is on point and explaining why this is taking longer or why this investment is multi-half and not just single half. So managing the timeframes and expectations is important. And C, uh, and I would love to have uh, the panel contribute to this one, is uh, the C from my angle is I always have a plan B. From my own personal example, there are, there are definitely... Uh, Places where we thought the ML will help us, but we it did not. It did not. The results were not what we needed. So having a plan B that what are we going to do if if this doesn't work out always helps, especially in uh, um, when you're dealing with ML and AI technologies. Thank you, Prashant. That was really insightful. Shandru, maybe you want to add something more. And I think both Siddharth and Prashant touched on it. There are like you are engaging with new stakeholder here, which is data scientists, AI focused scientists, data and research scientists. So maybe what is a new engagement style needed for PMs to work with them? Maybe you can highlight a little bit more on that. That will be great. Sure. Uh, well, I think Prashant and Siddharth uh, outlaid some of the very good challenges here with changes engagement model. But when I take a step back, I actually see a paradigm shift in some of our PM approaches. You know, a traditional PM approach is move fast, break things and build. But with the AI and working with data scientists, research scientists, technical architects here, I feel it's more about experiment fast so you don't break things later. And I think that is a fundamental shift as we go into more AI intensive uh, products or applications, right? Um, I wanna touch on 
one important aspect which Prashant mentioned, right? Like, although I think it deserves a spotlight on it, which is the ambiguity and the opaqueness of such uh, projects. I mean, think about it. Um, traditionally, we know that, hey, this is not the project about, this is the value proposition. This is what we are going to get out of the project, and these are the schedule timelines. Now, let's take that and put that under the lens of an AI product. And then things start shifting dramatically, right? For example, talk about the fact that it's a non-deterministic outcomes here, right? It's not a one is to one equation anymore. Even data scientists, research scientists working on the model cannot tell you what the output is about. Try explaining that to senior leadership that you're not sure what the output could look like, right? Or talk about the opaqueness, right? I mean, you don't know which model is being used because various models are being experimented. You're not sure about the trading data because when you slice and dice data, you have to, you know, not cherry pick, but filter the data into something which is reasonable for your product, right? Let's talk about trade-off decisions, right? Something which a product managers need to excel in. And now what do you trade? Do you trade experiment versus speed of execution? Do you trade um, you know, moving fast or trying to get more training data and more features built in over there. Because if you think about it, coding is actually the smallest part of the puzzle, the smallest lead time in an AI data. It's a training and model selection and data cleanup, which takes a lot more time, right? So when I'm working now with a team of uh, uh, data scientists and others, I actually feel like a warrior trying to, you know, way through and pushing off all of these challenges. And boy, do I yearn for the hills at some of these days. But I, I think it's a it's a very evolving landscape. And as it, it keeps evolving, I think the PM frameworks may need to be enlarged to, you know, to understand the AI umbrella, as Prashant put it forward. That is so insightful. I can totally see that in a PM world, it changing from that traditional to AI where there's so much of uncertainty. Very well said, all three of you, like, you know, like Shant, Siddharth, Prashant, and Shantanu. With that said, I actually want to like, switch gears a little bit, moving away from uh, challenges. I want to get a take from Omkar. I'm sure at Shopify, you see it all the time. But I want to understand from you, where do you see are the most opportunities for disruption with this advent of generative AI, which we have been talking about? Maybe you can share some thoughts, you know, like from your current experience on Shopify. How does it AI impact on e-commerce and advertising? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, um, first of all, I think like all of the panelists have like uh, you know uh, are so erudite and, and and put things together and uh, so beautifully. Uh, so, like, I'm glad. Uh, in terms of like actual applications of AI, uh, I'd like to like take that question in two parts. One is like before the advent of chat generative AI specifically and before that AI in general, because AI, again, I think it's, it's a whole universe. And right now the spotlight is so much on chat GPT that there is, uh, I don't think we've even like taken full advantage of pre chat GPT AI applications. Like when it comes to e-commerce, throughout the value chain, right? From supply chain optimization to inventory management, to content generation, to personalized recommendations, to like, you know, um, uh, reaching out to like uh, uh, customers that have left your item in the cart, et cetera. There's so, so many wide variety of applications. Uh, I think even those people haven't still mastered. A lot of the companies are still nascent in, in, in that sense. And with the advent of generative AI, especially at Shopify, for example, uh, the way uh, we've uh, applied that is, I'm sure like most of you have seen it, uh, is, is through this product called Sidekick, where it's like a GPT type technology that looks internally at our own data and essentially performs as a, a sidekick to a merchant who's running the business. In previously, we had to build all, the, all of these like growth tactics that we had to like go, get in figure out how do we get in front of the merchant to tell them, here's what you should be doing next in order to grow your business. And we had to like, it was almost like a growth PM's job to think about how do we get the merchant to like see this, 
use this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas now, it's almost as if the merchant is asking the questions themselves, and you know, on whatever question they ask, we can look at the you know treasure trove data that we have and tell the merchant what they should be investing their time in. As you know, these merchants are always time strapped, and they want to know what is the best use of their time in order to get maximized returns. And so that's where I see the biggest application happening, at least from a Shopify perspective. Advertising is, again, I think advertising has been one of those um, uh, domains that's already pretty mature. And like, we've, we've, um, from a programmatic perspective, I think we've done quite a bit over the last many, many years. But again, uh, the challenges within the advertising world, as, as you all know, is, is around privacy, around ATT, around uh, cookies. And so with all of those challenges, now how do we build better identity graphs for people? And that's where I think, uh, again, AI can really, really help and improve the return on ad spend uh, as well. So like that's on the, on the, on the, on sort of like the, the fag end of advertising. And then there's also like a lot of applications in terms of just building the creatives itself, right? Like uh, I think I honestly feel like old school ad, ag ad agencies are ripe for disruption right now. And, you know, people can very, very quickly come up with high quality creative content uh, and can completely run an end to end flow of like running an advertisement all by themselves or with little help from technology or tools that are available with little help from agencies. Sorry. So I think there's a lot of a uh, lot of, uh, you know, real world use cases that uh, generative AI and AI holistically has has, has already has uh, uh, I think impacting you know e-commerce and advertising in a very very positive way. That is amazing, Omkar, and I think you almost ordered a part of part question which came from our audience of two of tools apart from Chat GPT and Bard and other LLM models which we should be aware of. So that's great. Um, with that said, like Shantanu, I actually wanted to get your take also on it. Like, you know, you come from a very little bit different background. So what would you agree with what Omkar said? And also maybe like, you know, like expand on it. Tell us, you know, what could be the biggest disruption by AI on a company's capability building? Uh, thank you, Kushbu. And um, Omkar, you know, shared really well on the advertising and on the Shopify e-commerce space, some of the things which can be done. And again, we have to understand that with so many new things going on, when a companies like Google and Amazon and basically all the tech companies can get off, you know, caught off guard, which suddenly generate a AI coming into picture, right? These things keep evolving. But if I had to look at a trend or a resurgence of a trend which failed because the tech, the analytics was not keeping up the business need, then I would be excited about the digital twin concept, right? It, it's a concept which came a few years back, failed, came again, failed, and largely because, you know, it, it, so just for the audience, digital twin is essentially a virtual representation of a physical object or a system or a process, right? Essentially allowing you to simulate and model those behaviors, these interactions with the real world. And I'm not talking about metaverse here. Metaverse is very different, just a heads up, right? So this is more about, well, a good example would be, let's say a dynamic supply chain, right? Uh, imagine the COVID era, if a company could actually model exactly what's going on from e-commerce point of view, the warehouse, the delivery, the sort centers, and the last mile, or from a cloud point of view, the racks, the amount of demand coming in and how the servers are interacting with you know, the larger picture load balance. So if digital twin now finally with generative LLM, there seems to be a chance that we can build a better digital twin product, right? With lower investment upfront and higher investments, uh, higher returns coming back. For example, when I tried to implement a digital twin three years back, this was a very tough sell because it needs a big investment from a tech point of view. And there were enough returns in that case that we could build it. But now, if I look at the same project with generative AI sense, right, the fact that now the system will be able to give us a robust logical framework on how to simulate, how to, how to you know, um, module all these different concepts, how to get analytics and extra insights 
across it, whether it's advertising, customer excellence, people training, supply chains, the example which I gave. I think that is where I'm really, really excited because um, I think reinvents of all these concepts which are out there but did not happen is going to make it a very exciting world for us PMs, right? So we better you know, get our growth mindset on and start focusing on understanding all these concepts. Uh, I, I hope that answers your questions, Kushbu. It definitely does, Shantanu. And um, with that said, I actually want to take some questions from the audience. They are finding it very useful to learn from you all. So one question which actually got my interest, like, like, and I also want to know it. Can you give some examples or like, like maybe someone else from the panel also can give some example on how do you leverage AI to reduce the cost for PM functions? Is there any tools which you guys use? Like maybe ask Chad GB to write your blog post, <laughs> something like that, fun. Uh, I, can, I can take it. I can take the first tab and I'm sure this is, this is a fun question, right? I mean, uh, uh, at least at my company, we are exploring multiple ways. Uh, one of the things which we all know, writing is a big part of the PM job. Writing is in communication, especially writing, how do you communicate and distill your ideas? So I can give a personal example where I find it useful. I almost brainstorm and it 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 reduces my time while the, the critical thinking still comes from I don't expect uh chat GBT or the metas llama to do critical thinking for me, but it gives me framework. Yeah, framework on which I can then apply my uh knowledge and build it and make so that takes away 30 40 percent of my time. I'll give another example. I am right now building in like any role you do community community and, and build a community. I'm part of building the community at Meta. And uh, I need to come up with things we can do, such as these tech talks. And I would just reach out to Lemma, give a like, bunch, bunch of ideas, and then I can do the hacking itself. So that's one example, which I think has really taken off that low level work, which I could expedite using these uh, generative uh, AI models. But I would love to hear from other people. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I just want to add to what Prashant, uh, Prashant uh, was saying. I see the question is from Vineet. Vineet and I actually used to work together a long time ago. So hi, Vineet. Uh, so anyway, uh, I think the uh, the way I at least uh, use it, and I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing what uh, Prashant is saying here, is is I kind of like when I have to like think about uh, any sort of proposal or a brief that I'm thinking of, Obviously, the most obvious application that everybody is talking about is like get them get AI to grow your draft, and then you can like you know fine tune it and so on. But the way I think about it is, uh, you know, it's usually a decision tree that you are thinking through, and the model is your own, right? Like you're thinking about various aspects of a particular strategy, mm -hmm. and it, you can almost chart it out as a decision tree, and then while you're evaluating each node of that decision tree, I think that's where I think ChatGPT can be really, really useful, where I'm quickly able to like analyze a couple of segments, think about like, you know, what's happening in a particular uh, particular decision point and so on and so forth. So that way I'm able to really accelerate my own sort of validate a lot of my own uh, assumptions or uh, things like that while I'm working through a strategy. So. Yeah, I'm sure other other people are using it in other ways. Uh, maybe Siddharth, I think you have something. I just add one more thing into it. Like most of the, those larger companies have a policy against using these open source models. So when you do use them, you have to be very careful on what information you're allowed to put there. Because assume that whatever you put there is there for eternity, sort of. It's just there for anyone to use. Just imagine any of the global companies, some product manager put their strategy into the thing just for something, for rephrasing, and now their strategy is public. So while it is very important, just be very, very careful about what you put there. And again, it it's it also depends on the size of the startup or or is it a big company or a smaller company. But again, that's something to be very careful about. All right, I know we are at time, but I would like to ask one more question from my friend Adesh, and I think it's a very important question. What's the role humans and AI tools can play, design, implement, the, you know, like laws, regulation around these technologies? And as a follow-up question he has is, like, is technology industry doing everything possible to keep checks and regulates on these things? I know for a fact, like, you know, like Biden administration is looking on, like, you know, regulating on AI right now. There's a discussion going on. Top companies, which you are part of, has actually agreed voluntarily on it. So any 
take on it. Well, I'll attempt an answer here. And I guess a simple answer which I can give is that I think these things are still being worked out. And, and let's face it, even things like social media regulations have not been closed out correctly. We uncover so many different things all the time. Talking about AI, something which even these tech companies are struggling to figure out, right? And then you're expecting any government anywhere to figure it out and come up with regulations. I, I think that's a tough ask. However, if I look at the questions about how can we be a part of this uh, regulation framework, right? I think that's where it's important to understand that our own experiences and our own findings shared with the uh, regulation teams in our companies will help a lot, right? For example, the company which I belong to believes very strongly in ethics and having an ethical framework around all the products we sell. So if there is something in my product which I find out or something which I, an operating principle which I govern, I have all, my company has given me all the power to just reach out to the ethical team and talk to them about it and see how that can be implemented and they can see whether that has to be rolled out across this, right? But at the end of the day, uh, you know, um, sharing the cautionary note from Siddharth, proprietary information on open source models, plus having a very clear understanding from a viewer point of view. That's what's created by AI and what's created by humans. I think these two things should be upfront in any regulation framework. Yep. I agree with you, Shantanu, 100%. And I think people need to think about it. When you're thinking about AI, it's about training and using that information and creating logic on top of it. There's no man. There's majority of the time there's no manipulation of the data, and there's always a human who's making the end decision. They use AI to give them some inferences, some logics, some useful data points. But in the end, the human is the one who's actually controlling how to use that information. With one that, thing I'd like to uh, just add. I think this is such an interesting topic, and to like just to add what Shantanu was saying, what I'm what I'm hopeful of, of when social media came, it was a wild, wild west. We did not know what we were jumping into, and the regulations came way later. It was too late, and you know, Europe was the leading with GDPR, and and now, as Shantan said, we're still figuring it out. So, one thing I'm hopeful for is we have seen those movies. We have we have been there. We have seen what lack of regulations does. So, I think everybody should do more, and we are a little bit more cognizant, and we all should collectively be more cognizant of uh, how to use this technology responsibly. And I do have a hope that this time, uh, if not everything, but uh, more better efforts are being done to make sure that we build it in a way which actually truly add values versus take away value from society. Definitely. I think, yeah, we all are more on the AI lens. Everyone is being more thoughtful considering how everything has, has been evolving in the world. With that said, it's a very good note to actually end our discussion on today. I would like to do a special thank you to Shantanu, Omkar, Prashant, and Siddharth for taking out a valuable their valuable time out of their day and help these aspiring and existing product managers on how to be, be part of this AI trend. And it, AI is not just disrupting the way we get out our information, but how even mm -hmm. as a we are building those things. So thank you all for joining us and thank you everyone from the audience for amazing questions. Feel free to connect with any of the panelists and anyone on the product manager group. So we will be happy to answer your questions offline as well. Cool. And thank you, Kuchu, for moderating the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.